Keith, happy new year to you. Good morning to you. Morning, James. How are we? Yeah, good. Um, no better man than you to talk to, who obviously very familiar with uh, these lads coming through at underage level. Let's talk about Adam first. <clears throat> Were, were you in any way surprised by the breakthrough that he had at the weekend, or have you kind of seen this coming for a while? Yeah, I've known Adam for for a good few years. Obviously, been involved in the underage setups. He would have won, would have been one that would have played up a year. Um, his his size, obviously, physical presence always helps with that. But every single step he's taken in his career, whether it be under 17s when he was in under 16s or in the 21s last year. I haven't only been 18 years of age when he when he makes his debut. He's taken the steps with, with relative ease, I would say. Um, but he's had to be patient this year in particular at, at Norwich because he could have got plenty of long moves, but they wanted to keep him close to the to the first team. And, and in the last week or so, getting his Premier League debut and, and obviously well and truly on everyone's radar after his, his hat-trick in the, in the FA Cup against the, a proper team in, in Preston going away. He's, uh, he's well and truly on everyone's radar and he's done very, very well. The, the manager afterwards said he's not going to go on loan. Apparently Doncaster were in and uh, they were close to a deal being done. In some ways, you know, you wouldn't mind seeing somebody like that go out on loan and just play football for the next four or five months for the rest of the season. Because at, at Norwich, like, it's a Premier League team. His minutes will automatically be fewer than they would be if he was to go out on loan. Yeah, yeah I think I think the issue you have with, with these young players is that it's brilliant that they do well and the respective club managers think highly of them. But you can, you can ironically be too close to a first team and that, and that is actually detrimental to your development because you don't get enough minutes. And, and even when you're that close and you're on the bench, you don't even play 23s football at times. So your general fitness isn't, isn't quite up to speed. So, yeah, you're right. They look, I think the Doncaster ones... I would imagine dead and buried now. I spoke to Doncaster system manager last week, and he was of the uh, assumption that it was kind of done and dusted. But I'd be very surprised if that if that happens now after his exploits at the weekend against Preston. Yeah, because like, is he ready to play 15 minutes at the end of a Premier League match? Well, after getting a hat trick against a good Championship team at the weekend, you you'd have to say yes. You know he's playing understudy to Timu Puki, who's, who's got a bit of a knock at the moment. All along this season, he's kind of been third choice striker of the first, and he's trained with the first team all season. Um, they only play with one striker. It's the way they play, and Puki's obviously their number one striker. So it'll be interesting to see how that develops over, over the coming weeks. But you can only imagine what he's feeling at the moment, the confidence to be through the roof, the confidence that other players will have in him now. They'll, they'll have seen it in training. Um, Daniel Farke has said, Earlier in the season, the game against Crawley in the League Cup not quite hit the heights, but he's uh, he certainly done that on Saturday against Preston. It's been mentioned in a couple of the articles, Keith, about how Adam obviously was earmarked from a very young age as having a great physique and just a great technical player. But his work rate was something that had to be worked on. Is that something that you'd agree with that you've seen over the last couple of years? Yeah, I feel like... I've, I've built up a decent relationship with Adam because I've worked with him for a few years and I, I think there's an element of trust there. So I can be very frank and honest with, with Adam about his game and there's certain aspects, like every single young player, that, that you have to work on. Um, the goal-scoring <clears throat> instinct, I think, has always been there and it's probably unusual for a player of that size to have that. You normally think of a, a fox-in-the-box type predatory striker and he's not that because of his physique, but he's got a very good clinical edge to his game, but general parts of his game, general hold of play, types of runs that he makes, how to affect the opposition out of possession, all these types of aspects of the game are areas that, that he that he needs to work on. Um, but I think as long as he's focused, as long as he keeps that focus, those areas will come. He, he has the area where you know a lot of strikers crave for, and that's in front of goal, the different types of finishes that he that he can produce, he he, he has on the blocker already. He's six foot three, so he's a big lad. Yeah, he's a unit. Yeah, he's an absolute unit, and when he uses that uh, to his benefit, and when he really gets into that mode of I'm 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 on it today, and I'm going to show the opposition centre half that I'm in business. And you only need to look at a few of the games that we've played with the twenty one 
against top, top opposition. We played Brazil in the Toulon tournament and they had two centre-halves that are worth gazillions. Gave them a really tough time against Italy and Salah. You've got players that are playing for Inter Milan, Bastoni, centre-half. And he, he made him look very, very ordinary. And, and they're all aspects out of possession and running him behind and, 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 and threatening him behind and showing that pace and utilising that pace and power. Because when you have those attributes and you, and you don't use them, then they, they're obviously not going to be very, very effective. So I think it's just bringing all parts of his game together. And I think he's at a football club that, that work hard at that in terms of trying to develop him as, a, as an individual within that team structure, obviously. Yeah. We were, we were chatting there before you came on air just about how long it's been since we had four players uh, at that age group who are breaking through at the same time who are all attacking players so there's himself there's Conley there's Parrott and there's Obafemi at the moment it's unbelievably exciting it must be exciting for you guys to be involved with at that level as well to kind of to see the different rates of progression that they're all going through at the moment yeah it's brilliant isn't it like we've, look, we've, had, we've had a good year in terms of them playing them scoring goals them producing some brilliant performances all of them um, but then there's big chunks, isn't there, in between international camps. And international teams can only do so much for for individual players. You give them a little bit of a platform, even when at club level maybe it's not going as well or they've had an injury or they've had a dip in form. It, 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 I think it's nice because I've had it as a player and I, I know how much I cherished it when you came back into the international fold and you had that belief in you. Um, you, you can go again. But between November and March, it's a huge chunk of time. And, and then it's very much down to what they do at, at club level. But it's, it's also an exciting time because we've seen it. But they have got first-team action. So we need them to develop that first-team action. And whether that's going to be at their respective clubs or potentially in January going and, going and getting a long move to, to further develop and kick on again to the next level. I, I, look, it's just, it's just exciting overall as long as they keep developing in, in the way that we think they can. Were you, support, were you surprised that Troy Parrott didn't get on yesterday, Keith? And like, I mean, there was some suggestion that the, when Jose came in, the, the loose kind of notion that perhaps he doesn't give young players a chance, and then you see him uh, getting the, the Premier League match ball a couple of weeks back, and there's talks of a new contract. Then this morning, it's kind of hard to know exactly where he lies, but perhaps it, it just comes with the youth and uh, inexperience at this point to not be thrown in when Spurs needed a goal yesterday. Yeah, look, it's, it's one of those where they obviously feel the right path for Troy is using him at the right time. A little bit like Adam having him around the training set up every single day to get used to that type of intensity of training. And, and you have to remember how young Troy and in particular is. Um, and, and it may well be that you know he's used in that way where he gets a few minutes here and there or if they see fit at a certain stage he can play a few games. But then maybe next season that, that they have earmarked for him to, to go on loan. And again, I, I'm just thinking out loud. But is it disappointing from our perspective? Yes, I suppose to a degree. But also, we have to be, be patient with them because they are they are very young at the same time. Darrow Shea was uh, a name that kind of went under the radar at the weekend. I think everybody would go under the radar when you've got uh, an Irish youngster scoring a hat-trick. But uh, he's had an interesting time so far at West Brom. I just didn't realise how much Slavin Bilic loves him. He's a huge Darrow Shea fan. Yeah, I spoke to, I spoke to Slavin Bilic at the first game of the season. I covered the first game. It was at Nottingham Forest. And I spoke to him that day. Uh, and he said that day how much did he, he, he rated Darrell Shea. And I think he was speaking about before I came on about the reason why they did bring in another centre-half. And this goes back to what I was saying about being so close to a first team. And, and I've been in that position myself in my early 20s where we were playing 4-4-2. We had really good central midfielders, Paul Ince, Alex Ray, Colin Cameron. I was always part of it, but I, I didn't develop in the, in, the, in the space of a year, 18 months. And, and, I, and I actually declined as a player because I just wasn't playing enough minutes at first-team level. Now, that O'Shea is, is so close to that first-team and he's so highly thought of by Slavin Village and the football club. It's a delicate one for him because they're in a, such a good position in the league. You can understand the predicament that Slavin Village is in that if anything happens to Higazi or or, or uh, Ajoy at centre-half, he, he'll go straight in. He, he, he's shown that. He's proved that he, he will do that. Um, but he's, he's one of the most improved players that we have over the last year, 18 months, after his loan spell at, at Exeter, where he was outstanding. And he got, it got him used to, to playing competitive football. And, and I think it got him into a mindset of away from 
18, 23 is football. That yeah, this is this is way this is the way I need to train. This is the way I need to prepare to be a, a proper professional. So I've got a lot of admiration for Derek. Yeah, the uh, the future is feeling pretty bright at the moment with uh, that crop of players coming through. Um, before I let you go here, Keith, just wanted to ask you a little bit about uh, Arsenal playing Leeds tonight in the FA Cup as well. Bielsa obviously is saying that his main uh, thrust of the entire season is to get that team promoted, and so this isn't that big a game for him, but that he wants these games uh, to be part of Leeds' future. What do you think is going to happen tonight, and what do you make of how Leeds are going at the moment? Yeah, Leeds are, Leeds are doing well. They've, they've haven't played brilliantly over the last month, I would suggest. Um, but when that happened last year, they, you know, unless they were dominating games and taking chances, it, it cost them. That's what ended up costing. They ran out of a little bit of steam. The issue, the issue this time around is they've just lost two very, very talented players. Eddie and Ketty has gone back to Arsenal. And there's a little bit of frustration, I think, from from, from Leeds fans that, that he has gone back because they are a little bit light in that department now. I only have enough. Patrick Bamford, really. Um, and Jack Clark, who, who they sold the Spurs, got long back. He, he was an outstanding player for them at times last year. He had a bit of an illness and an injury. Uh, so they need to fill those boys. Um, look, they've built up a nice little lead themselves in West Brom at, at the top of the table. And I, and I think they'll see it off this year. I think they'll have enough as long as they maybe replace those two players. And, and those players that have been with Bielsa now for the space of 18 months or so, they still play a very, very high-energy, high-pressing game, and it's, and it's brilliant to watch. Um, and it's going to be interesting to see how many changes they make tonight for the, for the game against Arsenal. We've seen the amount of changes over the weekend. It's quite sad in a way, but equally, I, I can't particularly blame club managers with the hectic schedule over Christmas because it's uh, been relentless.